We had some good messages while we were, while we were gone. We listened to them, as I said. Um, Aaron talking about super thoughts, and uh, actually the WSU football players predicted the right outcome of the game, even though I was rooting for the other one. Sorry, um, Mr. Anderson. But uh, Amir talked about a very present help. God helps us in the present. His presence is what we need. And Pastor Tom talked about happy, healthy, and whole, even though we can't spell real good. <laughs> I want to I keep talking about the presence of God. I, I, I'm sure I'll be on this until, the, until we have a break, um, until the students are gone. It's just, we're nothing without his presence. We just need him 24-7. I want to talk uh, this morning. Why don't we stand and we'll go through our scripture. I'm not going to get this to the scripture to the very end, so don't be scared but I'm going to start with it. It's in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. Jesus said this, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. You may be seated. I want to talk about God when he says, I am with you. I am with you. I am with you. What does it mean when God says, I am with you? I am with you. I, I, I put a definition out here. What does it mean? <clears throat> I think this. I am here, and I am aware of what is going on in your life, and I am moving on your behalf. Regardless of what it looks like, Trust me. Don't give up. If it's tough, it will get better. If it's easy, it will get tougher. That is just life. That's how it works. It goes like this. Hang in there. It'll get better. If it's going great, hey, don't worry. It'll, it's going to be some difficulties. It's just what it is. It's life. This isn't heaven. This is earth. And life does that. So understand the cycles. So hang in there. Don't give up. God's with you. Amen. And that is how I grow you, is what he says. That's how I grow you. I grow you through that cycle. As you learn to trust me and lean upon me and understand that I'm there for you and I'm helping you and you see me open up some doors and do some things or help you not do some things. I just, even today, I, I, something happened. I was, <laughs> well, I won't tell you what I was doing. I'll tell you what I was doing. I was spitting something out of my mouth. I was spitting something out of my mouth, and I had my jacket up like that, and I missed my jacket. And all I said was, Lord, thank you for helping me miss my jacket when I just spit. So I know that that's not very spiritual at all. <laughs> but to me, it meant something. I didn't have to clean my jacket up. Okay, I'm just saying, I'm like, I'm weird, okay? You just, uh, uh, I talk to him a lot. I, I thank him a lot. I'm going, I about hit a car. And I go, oh, Jesus, thank you for helping me. And I hit the car. I've also hit a car. <laughs> I said, oh, thank you, Jesus. Please help him not sue me. <laughs> I just like to thank him because he's, he's involved. He's doing stuff all the time. He loves you. He's with you. You're not alone. You're divine inspiration from God, and he's got divine destiny written all over you. We go through the ups and downs with Jesus, and we grow as men and women of God. We, we, there's a day when we call them mogats and wogats, men of God in training or a woman of God in training, and we're all in training. You'll be in training until they throw the dirt on you right at the end of your life. We're always in training. God's always training. He's always growing us. <clears throat> so I want to talk. I'm going to examine, do an examination of seven different people throughout biblical history who God said to them, I am with you. And every one of them was going through some sort of difficulty, and God wanted them to know, I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. You're not alone. So we're going to kind of hit it pretty fast. I got seven of them. 
I'm already five minutes in. <laughs> First one is Isaac. It's around the year 2000, somewhere in there, give or take, B.C. Isaac's in the Negev, which is, which the Negev is a Hebrew word. The root of it means a dry land. Dry land. It, it, it's talking about the desert. It's also a directional. Negev was south. It was south in, in Israel. And it's also used as a, as a direction. And God's prospering him. He's, he's, he's doing great stuff. And he's living with the Philistines at the time. And, uh, and God's blessing him. And all the Philistines are jealous of all of the blessing that's happened to him and doesn't seem to be happening as much to them. So what they do <clears throat> is, is uh, uh, Abraham, his father, had dug all these wells. And so the Philistines were filling the wells back in. And so he redug a well, and he's, he's, he's digging a well, and he finally digs one up and, uh, in Gerar, and the Philistines come, and they claim it for themselves. They basically steal his water. you got to understand, he's a blessed man. He has a lot of sheep, a lot of cattle, and he needs water for himself. Without that water, everything dies. So it's, it, it, this is a very serious thing that's going on in his life right now. He needs water. He needs a well. He needs to be somewhere. And so he's being persecuted by these people, and so he wanders around and wanders and wanders, and we come to this verse in, in Genesis 26. <clears throat> he said, then he went up from there, from Gerar, to uh, Beersheba. He comes to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of your father, Abraham. Do not fear. Do not fear, for I am with you. Not just with your dad, not just with... Abraham, I'm with you too. I will bless you and multiply your descendants for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called on the name of the Lord, important part, important part. And he pitched his tents there and there Isaac's servants dug a well, dug a well. He's got water finally. It's interesting that the word Beersheba means well of the oath. That's what it means. Instead of wells being stolen, God gave him an oath of what he would do. He would, he would be there. He would bless them. He was giving him this water. And the blessing of the Lord was upon him. And therefore, he was going to be sustained. God was with him in the midst of his tragedy, of his difficulty. And my first observation here is, he says, God is with you, therefore do not fear. It's, a, it's his instructions. Right. It's instructions. Do not fear, for I am with you. Why should you not fear? Because God's with you. If God's with you, you shouldn't fear. Right. So if you have fear, you need to seek God some more because God's saying you're not supposed to have any fear. Yeah. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. Don't worry about it. I am with you. God did not say this. God did not say to him, I am with you, but it's going to be very scary. So I can understand if you freak out from time to time. I can understand if you just go, oh my gosh. In fact, this is scary for me too. I, I, God don't say that. He, he didn't say that. No, he said, I'm with you, you have no need to fear. I'm with you, you have no need to fear anything. It's all gonna be a-okay. I'm just growing you, and that's good. I'm growing you to be more of a man or a woman of God. I'm teaching you what faith is like. I'm teaching you to trust me. I'm teaching you to realize I'm there. I'm doing things. Don't fear. Fear's greatest tool is is the unknown. We usually get afraid when we don't know what's going to happen. We get uncertain. Anxiety. In mirror class, what is uncertain goals? Anxiety. We get anxious. We get anxious. And the more anxious we get about something, the more we panic. And the more we panic, the more we freak out. The more we freak out, the more we fear. And it just goes into a circle. And God says, stop it. Don't let your feelings run your life. Let me, let me, let me. 
In Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. God is with you. I don't care what situation, problem, issue you're going through today because we're all going through something. God's with you. He says, don't be afraid. I, I'll be there. But Lord, this is happening. I know, I'll be there. But this is, I know, I'm growing you. But I know, I know, I know, I know. And usually after time, we look back and go, oh yeah, yeah, he was there all the time. I think that's one thing I've grown in as a leader in the last 20 some years is to just trust him and don't freak out. Why waste all that time anxious when God had it all the time? Have faith, have faith. <clears throat> My next observation is God is with you. Don't fear. Instead, call on the name of the Lord. That's what he said here. Called on the name of the Lord. You know, Abraham, it says that he called on the name of the Lord three times. They're all calling on the name of the Lord. Help! I need some help. Hey, Lord, I need you to do something. Lord, he's calling on the name of the Lord. We need to be calling on him. The word call, Korah, <clears throat> it means, it means, <laughs> I like this. It's, it's, it's through the idea of Accosting a person. Accosting a person. Call on him to lead you, to protect you, to guide you, to help you, to grow you. And it has this idea of accosting a person. You see, it's not passive, it's aggressive. Yeah. Calling on the God is not, if you're up there and you'd like to do something for me, it'd be great. No, it's, it's aggressive. Hey, dude, see what's going on? Dude, I need you. Yeah. Do something. Do something about this, Lord. Help me. Come on. And, and it's, it's this, it's very active. Where, where's Calvin? Calvin, come on up here. Calvin, congratulations on, come on, run, run up here, Calvin, run. You're not going to huff and puff this time. This is I had him last time. He was the big bad wolf. Here's a, did you see what the definition was of, of to call on the person's name? What did it mean? Costing? Accosting the person, right? Okay, so here, I want us to act out. All right? I'm over here. I want you to call on me. Call. 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 Call my name. Phil. Phil. Go ahead. Phil. 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 Go. Oh. Uh, okay, so, so, so he's trying to get my attention, right? Okay, here, I'll, that was good. That was good. Let me show you. I'll show you too. Okay, Calvin, you walk away. Calvin, come here. Calvin, come here. Calvin! Boop, 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 boop. Ah! 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 Come on, I need you. I need you, man. Hey, I got some things going on. I need you to help me. You gonna help me? Yes. All right. Okay. Yeah, do we get the idea? God is not, he's not passive. Right. He's aggressive. Yes. He wants us to get aggressive in our relationship with him. When you call on him, yeah. you are, hey, you're shaking the heavens. Oh. Get a hold of him. Give Calvin another hand. Yeah. Oh, man. I need a breath. It's accosting his heart work. But I think sometimes we get in a relationship with the Lord. Everything's supposed to be nice. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray. Mm, yes. Oh. It's now I lay me down to sleep. My life is going to pot. Lord, I need your help. Okay. Sometimes we need to just let it out. Yeah. Just for somehow we think it's being rude wow. if we accost God. Let me tell you what. God's walking and you come up to him and you grab him and grab a hold of him. I tell you what, he'd be going, dude, this is awesome. <laughs> this is awesome. We've got to engage God 
engage him in a more aggressive manner, I think, than we do. We just feel like there's these proper things we're supposed to do as Christians. But it says, call it to accost him. Because this was life and death issues. And they're life and death issues for us too. They're life altering issues that we're all going through. You call on God. You call on God. And you believe he's gonna answer you. And you don't stop until you knock and you keep knocking. You ask and you keep asking. You keep going, you keep going. God's going, I'm just growing you in the process. He is with you. Walk in a strong relationship with him. Second person. Second person. You know, I, I think about when I was a kid, I, I, um, when I got scared at night, I'd come and crawl into bed with my dad and mom. I just got right between them. It was great. I just get in there, and when I got in bed between them, I was a little teeny kid, I just felt so secure. And you know what? The house and the surroundings, everything, everything was the same. The only thing that was different is I was with him. I was with him, and I knew he's big. And for some reason, in my little mind right then, he could, he could beat up anybody. He would make everything okay. And you know, God is so much bigger than that, and he will make things okay. Hang in there. I see so many p- people go through a depressive spot or an issue, and, 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 and they're real-life realities that happen, but God is saying, hold on in there. I see kids today up on campus commit suicide because some difficulty is happening. I'm going, oh my gosh, don't you know that's just listening to the enemy, that God is saying, I am with you. I got a plan. We've got a future. Things are going to get better. Don't let this drive the rest of your life right this moment. But realize, I have more for you. I have a destiny. I have a purpose. Second person, Jacob. About 1900 B.C. Isaac's son. We're going to pick it up in Genesis 28. Now Jacob, it says, who's alone, he's scared, went out from Beersheba and he went toward Haran. By the way, the, the word Haran means burning. He's fleeing from his brother Esau because he just stole his birthright. His dad just blessed him. Now Esau doesn't have a, he has a lesser blessing and Esau's a little perturbed, a little mad, a little angry. He wants to come after his brother. His mom says, get out of town. You need to go to Haran, go there. Can you imagine? Everything was normal in his life. And in an instant now, he's in the place all alone running from his brother. In a moment, everything that he knew was normal shifted in an instant. And he's literally alone and can't figure it out. Mom said God wanted to bless you, so he's supposed to take this and go, and don't feel like that right now. I'm alone. I'm scared by myself. I'm out here camping. And I'm supposed to go to a place I've never been. I'm scared. So he came to a certain place and stayed there all night because the sun had set. And he took one of the stones of that place and put it at his head and he lay down in that place to sleep. His life, as he knew it's over in a moment, he's crying, he's on the run, he's alone. And I love this next verse. Then he dreamed. And he dreamed. He dreamed. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth, and its top reached to heaven. And there the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. Think, wow, what a dream. His life was in total shambles, and yet he dreamed. God gave him a dream. My observation is don't stop dreaming in the difficult times. The Lord has something to show you. Don't stop dreaming because life seems like it's just all in array and you don't even want to live it anymore. Don't stop dreaming because God is going to lead you in and through this by the dreams that he gives you, by the things that are going to be ahead. Don't stop dreaming dreaming and believing about the future that God has for your life. 
It's amazing. It's amazing. <clears throat> and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land which you lie, I will give to you and your descendants. Also your descendants shall be as the dust of the earth. You shall spread abroad to the west and the east and the north and the south. All this land I'm going to give to you. And, 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 in, uh, and in you and in your seed, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. He's going, I'm going to give all of this to you. Oh, great. When does it start? 20 years from now. He's going to go 20 years to Haran. He's going to be there for 20 years, but God said, hey, I'm going to bless you. I have all this blessing for you, and even in Haran, I'll bless you while you're there. And then he says this in verse 15, behold, I am with you. Christian, God is with you. He is with you. He is with you. He is with you. And will keep you wherever you go. He'll keep you wherever you go and bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have spoken. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, surely the Lord is in this place. Duh. <laughs> but I like the next verse. And I did not know it. Wow. Where are you? Where are you right now? What tough thing are you going through? Do you know that he's there? He's there. We, like Jacob, need a revelation that whatever place we are in, the Lord is in this place. Good, bad, ugly, tough, easy, whatever place it is, God is in the place. God is there. He's in the place. The Lord is in this place. We just need to see with eyes what God is doing. He's up to something. He's doing something in your life. He wants you to know God is there. I am with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. I'm with you. And then he goes, he was running from Esau, one of the darkest and loneliest times of his life. And God was there, but he didn't know it. I love verse 17. And he was afraid and said, how awesome. <laughs> this lonely place, this place that it's difficult, this hard, this all of a sudden became an awesome place. An awesome place. This is none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. No matter what you are going through, remember these five things. Surely God is in the place, and you didn't know it. God is there whether you know it, feel it, believe it, or not. He is there. Doesn't matter what you feel. Doesn't even matter what you believe, he's still there. He would like you to believe he's there because that'll change your attitude and everything about everything that's going on. But he is there. He's there. He's there. He's there for you. Secondly, he will keep you wherever you go. The word keep here, shamar, it means to hedge about, to guard, to protect, to attend to. Thirdly, he will take you through whatever is going on. He's going to take you through it, through it, not around it. He will take you through it. Most people want to go around it or have it be gone. And he, God says, I'm going to take you through it. We don't learn anything if you go around it. If you go around it, he'll put it in front of you again until we go through it because that's how we grow. And number four, you are not alone. You have God and you have this family of believers behind you. You are not alone. You are not alone. <clears throat> and this last one, even though it might be a difficult place, it can also be an awesome place. And think about it. Sometimes the difficulties I've gone through and I'm just broken before God, laying before him crying becomes just an awesome place because it's just you and God. Nothing else really matters. I just need you, Lord. His presence is what makes it awesome. His presence makes it awesome. Jacob went from a lonely man on the run to a secure man with a destiny. Don't let the turmoil, the trouble, 
or the trial destroy your destiny. It's an awesome place. Thirdly, Isaiah, he's about 700 B.C. or so, the 700, somewhere in there. In this particular passage, Isaiah is speaking prophetically about the people who are going to go into captivity some 200 years before it happens. He's speaking about it. <clears throat> and he says this in Isaiah 41.10. Fear not. There it is again. Fear not, for I am with you. Now, understand this. God always takes fear out of the equation. You're going through something, God will always take fear out of it. He'll say, okay, don't make any decisions. No, let's get fear out of it. Get me in it. And let's, go, let's get through this. God always takes fear out of the equation. The devil always puts fear into the equation. If you're feeling fear, it's because the devil is speaking. You're listening to that. We've got to get it out. Get fear out. You won't make a good decision. You won't walk right. You won't. You got to get fear out. God takes it out. Fear not, for I'm with you. And because I'm with you, he says, be not dismayed. Don't be dismayed. For I am your God, and I'll do two things. I'll strengthen you. I'll help you. And I'll do one more thing, a bonus thing. Number three, I'll uphold you with my right hand. Dismayed. Don't be dismayed. I love this, this word. I, it's sha'ah. And it means, the definition here in the Hebrew is be nonplussed. Does anybody know what nonplussed means? A few people. The smart people know. Chill. Yep. There we go. Nonplussed. Huh? Chill. Chill? Nonplussed. I thought, was it supposed to be, you're supposed to be negative? I don't know. I don't know. It means this, the definition of nonplussed, surprised and confused by something so much that they are unsure how to react. I, I thought, have you ever hit something, surprised and confused by something so much that you're unsure how to react? He says, don't be that person. Don't be that. Don't be the person that, it's so shocking, it's whatever, that you just, I, I don't know what to do. He's saying, hey, I'm with you. Don't be dismayed. And then he gives us three things he's going to do for us, that his presence does for us. He says, I'll strengthen you. Amat, it means I'll give you courage. I'm going to give you courage. Secondly, I'm going to give you help. Azar, it means to surround, protect, aid. It means to sucker. Is that how you say it? Sucker, sucker. I give out suckers. To the kids <laughs> afterwards. All I know is they like them. It means, it means to suck. Is that, how do you say it? Sucker or sukar? Sucker? Sucker? It means assistance and support in times of hardship and distress. He's going to be there. Do you, do you understand? I can't. When I was doing this study, I can't tell you how much ammunition the Lord wants to give you as you're going through difficulty. That we think, oh God, why are you doing this to me? And he's going, what? I've got all this ammunition. I've got all this I'm giving you. We're going, why is this happening? And he's going, my gosh, I, 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 I'm giving you all the stuff you need. And he says, you'll uphold us to mock. And it means to sustain, to obtain, to keep, to help, to follow close. The third person here is Jeremiah. Or excuse me, the fourth person here, right, is Jeremiah. About the 600 B.C.s. It's during the destruction of Jerusalem, during the burning of the temple. All this stuff is happening because they've walked away from God, the people. And Jeremiah, in verse Chapter 15, verse 20 says this. For I am with you to save you and deliver you, says the Lord. I will deliver you from the hand of the wicked, number one, and I will redeem you from the grip of the, I love this word, terrible. 
I will redeem you from the grip of the terrible. He'll deliver us from the hand of the wicked. The word deliver means to snatch away. He'll snatch away. Deliver. The wicked is raw. It means bad, evil, either natural or a moral evil. He says, I will literally, from that bad, I, I will snatch you out of it. I will snatch you. I will deliver you. I will snatch you out. And then he says, I will redeem you from the grip of the terrible. Redeem here means to to sever, to ransom, to release. And the word terrible, aritz, it means fearful, powerful, or tyrannical. He will redeem. He will release you from the grip of the terrible. Do you have any terrible things that are happening in your life? Any difficulties? Anything you're saying, this is terrible. Or something terrible have a hold on you? He says, he will, he will release you from it. He is with you and able to release you from its hold on your life. But you have to let go of it. Lord, take the power of this thing away from me in my life, and you're holding on to it, <laughs> you, gotta, you have to release. You have to let go. Let go. I know that's difficult sometimes. We get in those besetting sins or those addictions or all of those things. It's very, very hard. I feel like it, the, the grip of the terrible has a hold of us. But he says, I'm with you. I will release the grip, but you have to release it to. It doesn't mean that it's easy. Let me, and any of this stuff, I'm not talking that we have just a, a fairy godfather and he just, bing, and it's just, he, he, he grows us in the process as we move through the things and elements of life. But he says, I'm with you. I'm there. I'm there. You're growing. It's good. It's an awesome place. Because God is there. <clears throat> Number five. Haggai, or Haggai, however you want to pronounce it. During the persecution and rebuilding of Jerusalem and the temple, after the release of captivity, now we're in about the 500 B.C. area there somewhere, 510, 515, some. <clears throat> and he says this. Who is left among you who saw this temple in its former glory? Remember, Jerusalem has been destroyed. The temple has been burnt. Um, They go into captivity. They come out of captivity. They come back and see it's just burn up. So they clean it up, and then they build a new temple there. But it's just, it's not like what Solomon put together in all of his glory. It just was so magnificent what Solomon did and all the gold and all. They just kind of build something right there. When they get done, the guys who knew about the other temple and then saw this one are are just sad. Just sad. We, We lost the glory. We lost the glory. We made some mistakes. We messed up. And this is the best we could do. Who was left among you who saw the temple in its former glory? And how do you see it now in comparison with it? Is it not in your eyes as nothing? It's a little box over here. Yet now be strong, Zerubbabel says the Lord. And be strong, Joshua, son of Jehoshadak, the high priest. And be strong, all you people of the land, says the Lord, and work. You know, God's always saying, if it's worth anything, then work it. Nothing just being happens. We have to work. And then he says, for I am with you. I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. hosts. According to the word that I <clears throat> commanded are covenanted with you when you came out of Egypt, so my spirit remains among you. Do not 
fear. There it is again. There it is again. First response is to get scared. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land. You know why God shakes stuff? When things shake? It's kind of like, have you ever walked through mud or debris and you get it all and you got those, those, those uh, vibrant soles or whatever and it gathers all that mud and all that junk and you're walking there and then all of a sudden you decide to come into the house and you're realizing, oh my gosh, I got all this. So you just, you're just shaking it, right? You see, God shakes stuff to get things to release and let go. Yeah. Yeah. He wants to get all the junk out. Yeah. He's always... Why does he shake your life up sometimes? He gets the junk out. We get a little more serious about the Lord. I need you, man. Hey, what are you saying? I want to do it. I, I need your help. All of a sudden, we start getting more serious in our walk and our relationship with him. God, help me to stay the same, good, bad, or ugly. But somehow we listen more and whatever when all of a sudden some shaking happens, whatever. And so what we're doing, we're getting all the debris, all the junk out clicking those boots, getting all the mud out. God's shaking. He's shaking something. He shook Israel right here because he was trying to get all of the false idols and junk out. Once more, I will shake heaven and earth and I will shake all the nations and they shall come to the, de to the desire of all nations and I will fill this temple. Now hear this. I will fill this temple. Who is the temple today? Who is it? We are the temple, right? So hear this. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine. The gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. In this verse 9. The glory of this box, this this sticks. This, this here, we had it so good and everything, and then it just got destroyed and every, everything got messed up and all we got left now is this box. I, I went through this trouble and all this stuff happened and now I'm just down to sticks. Everything was so good, now I've got sticks. And he says this, the glory of this temple, you, shall be greater than the former. But Lord, I've gone through all this. And I, oh, no, no. He's always saying, do you understand that what I have for ahead of you will always be greater than what I've got behind you? What I've got ahead of you will always be greater. It will be greater. It will be greater. And then when you get there, God is saying, I've got greater stuff ahead for you. You are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You are the presence of God. He is going to fill you with his glory. And it doesn't matter what happened in the past, how good it was then, or how bad it is now. But he's saying, hey, Amen. this ladder will be greater than the former. Why? Because I am with you and I never give up. I never give up. Don't give up hope for the glory that is yet to come in your life will be greater. Number six, Paul. He's in the 50s AD in Acts 18. Now the Lord spoke to Paul. He's going through lots of persecution, right? Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. What does he say? Do not be afraid. There it is again. But speak and do not keep silent. Why? For I am with you. And no one will attack you to hurt you. The Lord, they're all saying, all saying don't worry. I got you protected, for I have many people in this city. 
I have many people that are mine. They don't know they're mine yet. They're not saved. They don't know anything about it. I got a lot of people in the city I want to save. I want you to stay here. I want you to be bold. I want you to speak. I want you to get them saved because they're mine. So he continues there. A year and six months teaching the word of God among them. There are many in this city that are God's. Did he want to say, there are many in this city that God has for us to reach out to and say, we've got a challenge here. I don't know what, how all the challenges are going, but this first one is start acting like Jesus in front of people. I mean, isn't that what we're supposed to do anyway? I mean, let's act like Jesus in front of people and, and, and be kind and, and, and do something and move into their life. And all of a sudden they go, well, why did you do that? And all of a sudden maybe they, you can pray for them or find out something that's going on in their life or something where they're hurting. And all of a sudden, maybe like Calvin, Calvin didn't know the Lord. He didn't know the Lord. Somebody invited him to come to church, I'm guessing, because he came. He's here. And then some crazy person had him come up and do a message with him. And he was a big bad wolf. And he went from the big bad wolf in a couple of weeks to an angel. He got saved. That was a process that happened. Something happened there. And you know what? I, there's other people getting saved. I'm hearing about all sorts of folks that are getting saved. That it is so exciting. In this city, in this city, God is with you. God is with you. God, he'll give you the words in the hour of need. God is with us to help us reach our community for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't be afraid. Step out. Say something. Because God is with you. God is with you. Just be a friend. Act like Jesus. Do something kind. Watch what God will do. Calvin, I'm so proud of you, man. So proud of you. God wants to save people. An outreach culture, that's what we're to have. Outreach culture. Outreach culture. We need to tell people, come to Jesus. You're going to like the way you look. I guarantee it, you know. (laughs) Some of these people don't even know what that goes to. Let me get to number seven. Last one. Jesus. (laughs) And but let me say this, what he spoke goes from 30 AD to the present. All those others was for a time. This here, what Jesus spoke goes from 30 AD when he spoke it to the present. Because we read it today. Matthew 28, 19, Jesus instructions to us. They're Jesus' very last words to us. They're important. Go therefore and make disciples, evangelize. Evangelize, make disciples, make disciples of all the nations. I love, absolutely love all the nations that are represented in this church. From everywhere, almost every continent, everywhere, there's people from everywhere. That's heaven, man. That's what heaven's going to be like. We get the privilege with the university here bringing in so many different people that we get to evangelize the nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Make disciples. That word make disciples in the Greek lexicon means to cause people to become followers. That's why our statement of purpose here at Living Faith Fellowship is to make devoted followers of Jesus in community. We need all of us empowered by the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit does amazing stuff. Man, when the Holy Spirit moves, He can do stuff you could never do. He can melt a heart in an instant that you could, by all your words, never do. He is so amazing, and He lives in you. Just teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded. We found out that there's 50 of them. And Bible BF knew, right? 50 commandments. Not suggestions. And then he says this. And lo, I am with you. I'm with you right now. And what you're going through. 
I'm, I'm with you. I see it. I know it. I hear you cry. Trust me. I'll help you. I'll get you through. And you'll grow. You'll become so different. My glory will radiate on you. And you'll start changing your demeanor, your demeanor, your actions, your thoughts, your thinkings. Because I'm going to be with you. I'm going to work on you. And use life as the crucible that will just, I'll challenge you, I'll change you. You'll be different. And you'll love the way you look. I'm with you always, continuously, even to the end of the age. I'll always be there for you. I'll always be there for you. Hebrews 13 says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never, never leave you. I will never, never forsake you. Never. I know it's tough. I know it's hard. I know it's difficult, but I'm there for you. And I'll never leave. I'll never forsake you. Leave, the Greek word means to leave behind in some place, to desert. He won't desert you, to leave down or behind or abandon you. He'll never abandon you. He'll never forsake you. That word means to let up, to slacken, to desist. That means to stop, cease, quit, discontinue. The lexicon says to desert or forsake a person and thus leave the individual uncared for. He will never, ever leave you uncared for. God won't leave you. But you can leave God. God won't leave you ever. But you can leave God for a bottle, for a pill, for a relationship, for an idol. I know Carl talked about it at CCF. For something else that's of less value than him. A broken cistern. Something that slowly leads you away from him. No, I still, no. And we're walking away. But he'll never leave you. You can't lose God's presence, but you can lose consciousness of his presence. He'll never leave you. He'll never leave you. He'll never forsake you. So in the midst, when you're walking away from him, listen, when you're walking away from him and you're walking away and you know, remember this, when you stop and you turn around, he's there. He's always been there. He'll never leave you. He'll never leave you. He'll never leave you. He always loves you. He always cares for you. He's always there. He never will leave you. And when you stop like Peter and turn around, come to your senses and go, oh God, I messed up. Yeah. But I love you so much. Come back. We'll get through this together. Stay connected to God and to his body, the church, and let's keep walking. Throughout time, from 2000 BC to 2000 AD, for these 4,000 years, I've gone through the scriptures to talk about how I am with you. God is trying to tell us, I'm with you. Let's enjoy his presence and grow deeper and deeper in love with Amen. Father, we're going to take communion now. We know what it took for us to be saved. We were so wretched, so bad. And yet, you went to a cross and you died for us. You forgave us all of our sins. And then you said you'd never leave us, never forsake us. And and so we come to communion, Lord, to remember what you did for us. We remember with the bread that your body was broken on that, on that tree, on that cross, and that your blood with the juice, Lord, was poured out for us so we could be free. Lord, we come today to receive communion and to remember, remember, remember what you did 
for us. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Remember, this isn't our table. It's the Lord's table. You don't have to be a member of this church to partake of communion. You just have to know what it means to be saved. And as you come, the Bible says, come clean. If you got some sin in your life, just ask him to forgive you. Just go through it, Lord. Forgive me. He's so quick to forgive. He's, he's so amazing. Just forgive me, Lord. Forgive me. And then come and thank him for what his sacrifice has done for you and the life that he's given you. And enjoy it to the fullest because he is awesome. I love you guys. God bless.